in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? It's your man, Stephen Bartle, coming back at you with another edition of Bartle's Breakdown. I'm your host, and I've got a friend and a special guest on with me today, uh, a great friend, former uh, Illini teammate, Glenn Blackwell. Glenn, how you doing today, man? I'm wonderful, man. How you doing today? I'm doing great. I appreciate you taking the time and, and joining us. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to get a chance to chop it up with you because, um, you know, Glenn was a, a – Glenn and I were teammates at the University of Illinois. Glenn was a year – year year older, right, Glenn? Two, two years. Two years older. And so yep. Glenn used to look out for all the young cats, me and Kendall and Larry Smith and whatnot, and try to steer us on the right path when he could. So uh, – <laughs> Yeah, when I could, man. You know, we was youngest too, you know. <laughs> right. But you know what, Glenn? I want to I go back from the beginning. So you're from Highland Park. Right. Highland Park, Michigan. Right. How did you first get exposed to the game of basketball? Well, it uh, it started when I was in the fifth grade. Um, you know, uh, you probably know the story that my uncle was a professional football player. Reggie McKenzie. So, yep. So, so all my life, you know, from I was a little kid, never had a basketball. It was always a football. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember uh, I was always the tallest in my class. And I remember walking down the hallway in elementary school and there was a guy by the name of Tracy Sampson. Tracy Sampson said, big fella, man, I know, you are, I know you're a football lover, but uh, man, we need some more guys to play on the basketball team. I said, man, I don't know nothing about no basketball. And he was like, he was like uh, come on, man, we need you, man, we need you. And I said, all right, man, I'll try it. And I couldn't chew bubble gum and tie my shoe at the same time, you know, as far as playing basketball, but I was athletic, you know, and because of the football. And so long story short, man, I got out there and our first coach was Elmer Sigmund. And I mean, he kept me because I was a McKenzie. I'm Blackwell by marriage, but a McKenzie through the neighborhood. Okay. So he kept me. And then, uh, and then I liked it. Then the next year, sixth grade year, my mom, I well, first of all, I told my mom, I need some basketball shoes. She said, what? She said, well, you don't play no basketball. And I said, mom, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. And then a long story short, man, it was fifth, sixth. Then by my seventh grade year, man, I was a talk of the town. Then in the eighth grade year, it was uh, getting serious. And I was playing both football and basketball. So I was loving both sports. So uh, by the time I got to high school, I stopped playing uh, football. And I had a cousin who went to Michigan State on a scholarship. And so, and I had another, there, he was a running back. I would have been a starting quarterback for the high school team. Okay. And, um, and so these, so I'd have been handing the ball off to two division one uh, yeah, so my cousin Terry Lewis went on and started at Michigan State as a defensive back, got drafted by the San Diego Chargers and had a stint with them and a stint with the Indianapolis Colts. So, um, so it was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was serious. So, uh, were you better at football uh, or basketball? When you, when you started playing basketball, you started to get some success. Were you still better in football? Yeah, I was still better in football. Yeah, okay. it was, yeah. I mean, it was like uh, because I was a McKenzie again. My uncle was he played for the University of Michigan. He was All American at Michigan, and um, then of course you know Buffalo Bills with OJ Simpson. You know those guys. You know back in the day, OJ would come to Holland Park. I mean, it was we used to drive I, every other weekend. I was going to Buffalo. You know, meeting mm. meeting the likes of Jim Braxton and. You know, uh, and that back then, you know, Ahmad Rashad was uh, Bobby Bobby Hill. You know what I'm saying? It's his name. So, so I I was a football guru. Larry Little, the Dolphins. Oh yeah. It was so I was yeah so I was better. And then once I got to the eighth ninth grade, then um, I, I put the I, I hung the cleats up. You know, for football. And so when you were in high school, Glenn, uh, you came through in a glory time of basketball in terms of state of Michigan, in my opinion. Um, who were some of the guys that were coming through high school in the Detroit, Michigan area uh, when you were in high school? Uh, you probably, um, during my time, well, you may know Eric Turner. Remember oh, Eric? Heck yeah, e I, remember, I remember Eric Turner. Yeah so, yeah, so Eric Turner. Yes, Eric Turner. So these guys were older. So these are the Eric Turner, Sam Vincent, Walker D. Russell, so those are the guys that I follow, you know. Um, there was a guy by the name of Tony Ball. He uh, he graduated in 78. 
So I, you know, I would hang out with the older guys. And so they would take me to Wayne State to play and all of that. Mm. But, uh, but, you know, uh, we had our own um, um, uh, got all American, all state, all American. His name was Percy Cooper. Okay. And, yeah. So he was, he kind of mentored me. And then you had uh, Terry Durod, you know, Terry Durod, you know, played in Detroit, played, Mercy. In Detroit, played with the, played with the, the Pistons, Boston Celtics. He was a shooter. So, you know, when I, whenever I could pick his brain, he would say, young blood, young blood. You say, you want to become a better shooter? You say, got to shoot about three, three, five, three, 350 to 500 shots a day. And he said, you a lefty? Keep the ball in your right hand, man, and you're going to see the success. And mm. I found that. And so, uh, you know, um, I just, that's when I learned how to shoot, you know, following his, his, you know, following what he, you know, taught. Glenn, it's, it's interesting, man, because I inter interviewed B.J. Armstrong. He said the same thing about Terry Durod. He used to try to go to St. Cecilia's. St. Cecilia. When you, where everybody was, was hooping and, and the best pickup was. And he said he used to watch Terry Durod. And I guess Durod had, a, you know, kind of looked out for the youngins because he dropped some science on BJ as well that he, ref, he referred back to during the interview. So uh, Durod must have been a local legend, huh? Oh, Larry Bird. Ask Larry Bird. Larry Bird said he's probably one of the best shooters he played on, I think, the 81 championship team. And uh, Larry Bird Larry Bird said, Terry Dew, I was one of the best shooters that he's ever played with. Wow. Yeah, I mean, wow. yeah, he, when, he, when, he, when he shot that shot, Steve, I wish I had a book to show you. When he shot it, he's, his feet was this, he, I mean, he would get all, it was hard to block his shot. Okay, because yeah. he just had hops. Yeah, he had, yeah, he had, he had, he, he, he had hops, he was athletic. Um, you know, I mean, not like hops, like a dunker, but you just wasn't going to block that shot. Mm, okay. Yeah. And so, Glenn, you were having success in high school, and so I know you had a, you probably had all the Big Ten schools after you. Who were your top, like, three to five schools that you were looking at coming out? Uh, of course, you, you know, you had, all, you, you had all your, you know, I, what I did, and I tell my sons this, you know, I, I wanted to stay true to, to the Michigan brand in terms of giving them an opportunity to recruit. And the wildest dream that I didn't think that I would go to uh, Illinois. I didn't know that, but it was Coach Collins uh, who was the influence there. But I knew I wanted to play Big Ten basketball. Okay. I got my first. I got my first letter from Iowa. Hold on one second. Let's just saw up. Make sure this computer don't conk out on me. I got to make sure it's charging. Oh, that's all right. Yep. Uh, I, Iowa. I was. I got my first letter from Iowa. And then uh, I never forget. Um, uh, Coach Collins came to one of my high school games. And he had on remember that little that that cowboy <laughs> uh, jacket that with the the with tassels the, and everything. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he was shocked. So he come up in there. He come up in there, and everybody say, "Who was this cat?" And um, they found out that he was the University of Illinois. And he said, "Oh man, he here to see black man. He here to see black." And um, so uh, so that was. But to to answer your question. I had narrowed it down to three after I had, you know, all sorts of, from Henry Bibby, when Henry Bibby was at Arizona State, he came in, him and Luke, no, not Luke Olson. Henry Bibby was who? Well, he wasn't with Arizona, he was with Arizona State, yeah? That's right. Back, That's back right. in the day. Mm -hmm. um, I narrowed it down to Michigan, Illinois, and West Virginia. Mm. And, uh, and West Virginia uh, was, I narrowed it down to West Virginia because of uh, two former teammates were there. Bernardo Brown and J J J Crawl and uh, and Chico enrolled there. You remember Chico, right? Cheek, Cheek, little my best friend used to come down there. Yeah, Illinois. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cheek had enrolled at West Virginia, and they said, "Hey, you know, this would be a good fit. You know, your boy is here, and these three of your homeboys." Uh, but again, I knew I want. I I knew I if I'd have went there, man, I would have never gotten any work done. But uh, so I narrowed it down to uh, Michigan, Illinois, and, and then uh, West Virginia. And then when I went to, uh, took my visit to Michigan, uh, it was uh, 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 Richard Relford hosted yeah. me, Rich Relford and Butch Wade. And they took me straight to Bo Schenbackler's office, right? Strange, right? Bo Schenbackler. And the he, football coach. The football coach. Legendary football coach. The legendary football coach. And I okay. walked in his office. And he busted me in my chest. Boom! You are a Michigan man. Oh, okay. Don't forget it. Because, see, now his name is Glenn. 
Glenn Bullshit. Glenn. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he yeah, Bo Schembechler's name is Glenn. So he told me, he said, Glenn, you said in your he said your uncles are all American here, and so can you. And uh, but you know, at the time, Michigan had they were deep as far as their guards. Eric Turner, right? He hadn't declared to go pro yet. Gary Leslie. Grant was still there, right? No, Gary Grant, same year as me. Grant, oh, Gary wow. Grant, yeah. So Gary Grant came in the same year as me. So it was uh uh uh, again, it was uh, Eric Turner, Leslie Rockmore, Antoine. They had guard Thompson, Quincy Turner. Ooh, that's five guards. So, uh, so for me, I was like, wow. I mean, you know, I, I was. I mean, I'm confident in who I was. But then when Illinois, Illinois had Bruce, Doug, Tony, and then Quint, and then Quincy. Quincy is it? Uh, Q. Quinn Richardson. Yeah, Quinn Richardson. Yep. Yeah. Quinn Richardson was graduating for sure. So now you're only returning three guards. So so the way it worked, you know, Illinois was recruiting Gary Grant, but Purdue was cr- 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 recruiting Gary Grant. So, you know, you all you they were recruiting me as well. So whoever I signed with, the uh, guy with the Gary Grant would go the opposite. Or whoever whoever Gary was signed with, you kind of go to the opposite. Unless you know, you teamed up somewhere and said, hey, man, let's play together, something like that. But, uh, yeah, that's how it worked for me. So you, so it's interesting. So you, you, you cited Jimmy Collins, the assistant at Illinois, as one of the, you know, major reasons. Was he the real reason? Because I, I'm sure for a Michigan kid, man, when University of Michigan calls, it's hard to turn them down. I know they had guards and everything, but that was the main issue there was the, the, load, the load at the guard position. That, that's what kind yeah. of – yeah, that was a that was the main issue, and so I saw myself, you know, coming in, uh, you know, I wasn't back then. I wasn't looking at like I got to start or anything. I just wanted to be a part of the. I just want to be a part of the puzzle, sure. part of the mix. You know what I'm saying? And you know, um, but but Anthony Welch was there, you know, and so Anthony took me when I came to Illinois on my visit. It, Anthony Welch took me, and so he, he used to, you know he saw the vision too. He said, "Man, he said the guards are thin." He said, with your athleticism, I think he saw some, I don't know how he saw a clip. Maybe we were shooting jumpers. I don't know. Coach Collins told him about me. And uh, he said, with your athleticism, you know, you'll be, you'll probably be a part of the Knicks. Mm, okay. All right. So you get to Illinois and who's on the squad when you got there? <laughs> you know, I was looking at your, uh, I was looking at the, uh, the Big Ten Network clip when you when they the eighty nine team mm-hmm. and uh, and it was a part of uh, the guy who was you know in the studio with you and he was talking about you guys were loaded and I said to the TV I said man we were always loaded and it was like man so to answer your question so when I get there my freshman year so Scott Hafner was the other, uh, he was a guard. I don't know if you ever remember Scott, remember Scott Hafner. Because he transferred, I think, because you came in. Yeah, he transferred, me and him, same year. So he transferred after our freshman year and went to Evansville yep. and, uh, and had a stellar career there. But he and I, it was he and I uh, as freshmen. Then you had Tony Weisinger, Doug Altenberger, Tom Schaefer, right? Anthony Welch. Yep. Then you had George Montgomery, Ephraim Winters, right? Scott Mintz. Ooh. Scott Mintz, Bruce Douglas, uh, I'm forgetting somebody, Ken Norman. <laughs> man, we was loaded, man. Loaded, man. Loaded, okay. every position. So my freshman year, my freshman year, this was after Bruce and Ephraim had that stellar, uh, uh, you know, sophomore year. So my freshman year going into their junior year, <laughs> every position was preseason All-American. Did you hear what I said? Ooh, pardon me. I had to sneeze on that one. Every position was preseason All-American? Think about it. Bruce Douglas at the point. Yeah. All, yep. Doug Odenberg at the two. Yep. Anthony Welch at the three. Wow. George, Ephraim Winner at the four. And George Montgomery at the five. Yeah. And, and, and a lottery pick coming off the bench and Ken Norman. Ken Norman. Ken Norman and myself. And uh, and he was and coach used to say the best rebounder on the team is Ken Norman. The best one on one player is Blackwell. And you, we used to sit there and say, well, when we go get off the bench, <laughs> you know. But it was uh, it you know, it, it was man. We and you had Tom Schaefer, Scott Mintz, Tony Weisinger. Yeah, 
That's that's a loaded squad. That's loaded. Yeah. Our practices were brutal. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. Who? What are some of the uh, funny stories from your first two seasons at Illinois? Where did you have any funny stories or anything like that with Coach Henson? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Just how you know he just. Hey, Glenn, do you think that's defense? That's not defense. You're not playing defense. And, uh, what do you, you know, we, <laughs> Bruce, I don't know, Bruce. I don't know what made you think you were scoring now, but you're an all, you're an all defensive player. You're not the score. Get the ball up, Doug, and let <laughs> uh, a, Hey, so our viewers, Glenn is imitating Lou Henson was our head coach. Yes. Lou, when he get excited, his voice would raise. Yes, like he'd be calm, but then it, he'd get excited. His voice would go up like this, yeah. and he'd be all animated. So that's yeah. what you hear Glenn do. So yeah. that's good stuff, man. Um, yeah. And then you were a sophomore when Lowell came in, right? Right. Okay. All right. Because so Glenn was a junior when when our freshman class came in. Right. Lowell was a sophomore, and so. That was kind of our, our our nucleus for the team when we were freshmen. Uh, Ken Norman, Doug Allenberger, Tony Weisinger, Glenn, uh, Jens Kuyava, Lowell Hamilton. Uh, who am I missing? Olaf Blob. Oh, Olaf Blob. That's it. And that was about it because we had like a five or six recruiting class uh, as freshmen. So that that right. was pretty much made up the roster. So yeah. And, you know, one of the things I used to love, man, was how close you and Lowell Hamilton were. Why were you guys so close, Glenn? It all goes back to uh, when we went to AFPI, the the uh, you know all of the camp, all American camp, yep. yeah, the Nike, the Nike All American camp. Uh, when I had hair, uh, you know, I had straight hair. You remember I had straight hair, man. And so yep. Lowell, I remember Lowell. We were in the classroom. And all the Chicago guys, you know, you had all the Chicago guys, man. It was it was hilarious. And we had all the Detroit guys. And so that was a time where they brought Chicago, everybody, Chicago, Detroit. You know, you had the likings of from Detroit, B.J. Armstrong, Demetrius Gore, played at Pitt. Ooh. Uh, it, yeah, it was just uh, Clarence Jones or Bill Jones, yep. you know, just, just all of us, you know. And so uh, Lowe said, man. Is that your hair? That's your real hair? And he touched my waves. I had waves. I said, I said, man, yeah, this is my hair. And so from that point, man, me and Lowell became good friends. And uh, you know, it was a uh, you know, it was a kindred thing, man, you know. And uh, then we'll go to BC. You did you go to the BC camp down in Rizzo there? Rizzo there, Indiana. Yeah. Yeah. So when we was down there, I used to call Lowell Dr. J. And then Kenny Battle was a part of all that, man. Tim Hardaway. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, I mean, we and and we used to have some battles too, because you know Chicago, Detroit. Yeah. We, I mean, we was going at each other, but we had respect for one another, and uh, and that's where Low and I um became, you know, kind of kind of became friends, and through that, and then once I, uh, once I committed, and um, uh, I committed to Illinois, and then of course, uh, Coach uh, uh, Coach Collins was saying, well, you know Low Hamilton and Ben Wilson. Ben Wilson pretty much told me in the locker room when he was being recruited, oh, yeah, I'll be here. Don't worry about it. He So he was coming, huh, Black? He was coming. Ben, ben Wilson looked me dead in the eye in the locker room, and he winked and said, I I'll be here because, because I think Low had committed. I think Lowe committed early, if I'm not mistaken. I think, I think you're right. I think Lowe had right. committed. Lowe may have committed his junior year. Lowe committed, Lowe committed early. Okay. Uh, I, I don't remember the details, but I know Lowe had already committed. And Ben was like, oh, yeah. He looked at me, and we looked at each other. I said, big fella. And he said, no, I got you. I'll be here. And I was like, oh, we're going to be the – man, we're going to – that was 85. And then y'all came in at 86. Yeah. And it was a pipeline. It was a pipeline, and so, and I remember your class. You know, your class was a uh, y'all were dynamic, man. You know, dynamic group of guys that came in focused. And uh, but I'll get to that, man. Go ahead, keep asking your questions. Yeah, no, no. Uh, so you you have a really good career in Illinois. You're going to play professionally. Kind of walk us through uh, where you played professionally, Glenn. So uh, <clears throat> again, my uncle. Uh, I was a free agent, and so going into my senior year, that's when the NBA had cut the league from seven rounds to two, okay? 
And so uh, I guess it was your, your collective bargaining thing that they did. It was, you know, uh, so my uncle who at the time he was, he played, he ended his football career in Seattle with the Seattle Seahawks. And then he ended up being in the front office. So, uh, excuse me, he, um, I was a free agent and he got me a tryout. He ended up orchestrating a tryout for me to, to try out for the Seattle Supersonics with Bernie Bickerstaff. Him and Bernie Bickerstaff and the coaching staff, you know, they became friends because my uncle would do a, he would do a live show every Saturday night for the Seahawks. I mean, it was crazy, man. Oh, crazy. wow. Yeah, it was crazy. So he developed relationships. So they brought me in and uh, I had an extremely well uh, camp. Um, they had, they drafted Corey Gaines mm. out of Loyola Marymount. Yeah. And then, then the free agents was me, uh, uh, Ricky Winslow from Five Slamma Jamma, and Avery Johnson. Okay. Yeah. And Steve Woodside, I think it's Woodside out of Oregon. I think I'm getting his name right. So it was five of us. And so uh, I was in tip top shape. I had a pretty good um, showing in the beginning. Um, then uh, we went to uh, the L you know, LA Summer League back then. Mm -hmm. uh, me, Avery Johnson, Corey, uh, we turned it out. Man, we turned it out. And they invited us back to, uh, 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 and Winslow, invited back to vet camp. And, uh, and I made it, you know, I ma it was tough, man. And this is where I share with my son, you know, Jonathan, or any, you know, any, any player out there is if you can play two positions, if you know how to be a combo guard, if you know how to, if you can play the one and the two, or you can play the two and the three, it's going to market you that much more. So me, if you remember my days at Illinois, my concentration was more of a two. Yep. I never thought, I never really concentrated on bringing the ball down. I let you and Tony Weisinger do that. But had I hindsight, had I, had I understood that, or had, you know, the mentoring, I probably would have worked that that ball handling, so maybe Lou would have had the confidence for me to bring it out. I don't have to be the point guard, but at least have the ability to show that I can play that point guard position in That's spot. Right. That's right. And so, and so that was my. Uh, I mean, they love my athleticism. Um, Xavier McDaniel was on that team. He compared me. I remember one day he sat me down. He's like, "Man, you." And, he says, "Guys like you and Dale Ellis." The way y'all shoot the ball, man. I mean, he was comparing me to Dale Ellis, even though I can't shoot like Dale Ellis. That's high praise. That yeah, that's that's high praise. But long story short, uh, I end up getting cut. Uh, we play. I played in my. I played in the exhibition game at the University of Tennessee against Chicago Bulls. Um, this one, Sam Vincent was on the team hmm. and um, got in the game. And then uh, uh, I got that phone call from Bernie. He was like, you know, got to let you go. And uh, he said, but I want to send you to Yakima, Washington to play in the CBA. And I was like, Yakima, Washington, what is that? And he was like, it was, you know, he told me and everything. I said, you know what, coach, I appreciate the opportunity and everything, but I think I'm going to go back to school and get my degree. This was the, this was the final four year. This was going into your, yeah, junior year. What year yep, you go to final four? Junior year, yep. yep. So this was final four year. So I stayed uh, in Seattle until January hit because I, you know, I won't, I didn't come to that first semester. I came the second semester. Remember that? I came. Yes, to I do. Yep. So I just stayed in Seattle, lived with my uncle and worked. And then that was, uh, that was my professional career. I did have another opportunity, but I missed it. We didn't have cell phones back then. So uh, my agent who was working for me had me a, a opportunity to try out with Atlanta Hawks. And I had came back to Illinois, started getting stronger, working on my game a little bit. I realized I need to get stronger for the NBA, mm. and, and I missed the call. And um, but that was it for as far as my tryouts in terms of the NBA. And then once your season was over it, and I graduated, Lowell got the opportunity to play in Turkey, and then he called me and uh, said, "Black, they need a guard, man." And I said, man, I'm not coming to Turkey, man. You crazy? Are you? My, and my and my friend Sanford, are you crazy? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, he said, well, man, this is how much they pay me. I said, man, well, when do I leave? <laughs> so enough, huh? yeah. yeah. So that that uh, I ended up going to Turkey that first year, and I played in the Chorus Cup. Uh, and oh, then, did you really? Yeah, I played in the Chorus Cup. I only played twice a month. They paid me good money for twice a month, Steve. Wow. 
I mean, yeah, they were paying big money then too. Yeah, they was paying. Yeah, they paid good money. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, I, you know, I was like, wow. And so uh, I did well. I did well in it. And then I, uh, one of them, one of the games that I had against Greece, I, I played really well against Greece. Mm-hmm. And so I remembered that the next year. So my, so my first year was Turkey, and then the next year ended up going and playing Olympiacos in Greece. Wow. That's yeah. a big that's one of the bigger teams over there, right? Yeah. So we so out the gate, out the gate, I played for two of the biggest teams in Europe, FS Pilsen in Turkey. Yep. That goal that I played, and then Olympia Coast. They had uh George Papadakos. Remember George Papadakos? I do remember played? George, yep. Yeah, so he was a seven footer, so they didn't need to get a, a, a forward. You know, normally it was one American per team. So normally it would be a forward because the the you know the countries had good enough guards. Right. to, you know, to, to fare in the, in the conference or in the league. And uh, so George Papadakos was a seven-footer. They, we had a front line was impeccable. And they, they had me as a guard come in, and, and then that's when I uh, played there. And then after that year, we didn't make the playoffs. I didn't get, I didn't get to uh, – they didn't invite me back. And then I played CBA for Rockford Lightning. And then uh, I got hurt. And then uh, that's when uh, I got hurt, put me on IR. And when I came back, I played against the Oklahoma, Oklahoma, it wasn't the Thunder, whatever they were, it's Oklahoma City, whatever. Yeah, you know, Oklahoma City. Um, whatever they know. were. It'll come to me in a minute. Henry Bibby was coaching the team. That's right. That's right. And so I lit him up for about 18, 19 points, shooting it off the glass. You know how I used to do, shooting it off the glass and all that. And then after that game, the uh they they uh they uh they cut me so i went home yeah after that game crazy i went home and i get a call at midnight right so i think i've been home maybe three four days so i get a call after the three four days uh henry bibby called me and it was 12 it was 12 o'clock midnight again no cell phones he called me on my landline at my mother's house the phone rang and i said who is this he said he said blackwell he says, Coach, Bibby. I said, what's up, Coach? He said, man, I need you, man. I know they just cut you. And this is, they come down to Oklahoma. He said, man, I need you, man. He said, you know, he said, well, my, you know, I get guards in the league, man. Now, mind you, I had just accepted a job to work for the city of Holland Park as a deputy director in Parks and Recreation. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, so I had, so, and I had some money saved in the bank at the time. And I figured, you know, I got my degree. I said, let me, uh, let me, let me get my resume out. Let me start building on my resume. And I said, Coach, I'll call you in the morning after I have my decision. I never called him. Mm. Never called him. I went on and worked for, uh, for the parking recs for three years, and I still had the itch. And then I got a call from my boy Antoine Jobert to go play in Mexico. And I ended up going to play in the Mexico. And um, then after that, I did well, and uh, I played in the Philippines. And then, uh, and I quit my, I worked three years with this, the city of Holland Park and then I'm traveling and we didn't work on Friday. So I would travel to Mexico on Thursday evenings. Really? Yes. I traveled so much to Mexico during that time. The DEA, man, pulled me over, man. And they thought I was smuggling drugs. Are you serious, Blake? I swear to you. Listen. Oh my God. We, we I, so again, I worked for the city of Holland Park. We didn't work on Fridays. So games were Friday, Saturday, and Monday, something like that. I can't remember. So you had a three-day weekend, something like that. So I would fly out Thursdays. So I flew into San Antonio. So I had already flew a couple of times. So my, so where we were playing was like 30 minutes in Mexico. San Antonio's 30 minutes, something like that. Okay. So I so flew in to San Antonio. The coach and the, and the doctor, team doctor, they came and picked me up. So I'm my luggage is on the on the on the on the luggage bin. So the, one of the coach, the coach grabbed it, put it on the ground, and then the team doctor grabbed my other one and put it on the ground. So now we, I got my bag and we going through the to the airport. There was a guy who was like he was selling cigarettes. There was another guy acting like he was a luggage. They were DEA. Oh wow, that's crazy! They, they separated us. They said, "Did they go to?" They're speaking this. They're speaking in Spanish. They separated us. Took me in the room, and I'm like, "What the heck is this?" <laughs> they checked my bags and everything. 
Man, it was crazy. Man, we get to they then they then we of course everything clear. Man, we get to the game, man. We get in the locker rooms. We were sweating bricks. Man, I think that was the best game. <laughs> I think that was the best game I had. I think I think I had about 35. Antoine Jobert had, had, probably had about 40 because, you know, it was like, man, you know, because, you know, you hear those crazy things that's, you know, they planting drugs and all that. But, you know, so anyway, I played in Mexico. And then uh, after that, I uh, uh, ended up uh, resigning from my job. And then I get a, I get a, uh, I get a uh, contract to go play in Cyprus mm. for two years. And uh, and then that's what by that time, Low. Remember when Low tore his leg up? Yep, I do. So Low was on a rehab; he was recovering. So I was able to. Uh, he had played in Cyprus a year too. So uh, my second year in Cyprus, uh, I said, "Hey, Low, how much is available?" And they said, "Really?" And so Low came over. Man, we, you know, we tore it up. We went from the last place team my the, my first year to we was in the final four. That's that second year. And uh, wow. then after that, I played in Estonia and then I tore my Achilles tendon. This was 1998 by this time. Okay. Tore my Achilles tendon. I was done after that, man. So out of all the places that you played, uh, where did you like the most and where did you like the least and why? Uh, I would have to say Cyprus. Cyprus was uh, probably um, my best uh, stint, uh, you know, the best place that I played. Why? Because it, it was a family, you know, it was a family, it was Greek, you know, and, 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 mo and, you know, I spent three years of my, my, you know, overseas career playing for Greek team, but in Cyprus, it was a family, you know, oriented and, you know, and they, uh, they allowed me to um, hone in on some of my craft and that is uh, coaching. So I, I ended up coaching the the eight the sixteen national team. They allowed me to coach. Yeah, they allowed me to coach some of the sixteen. Some of the, I had some practices. Then they had me doing uh, camps. You know, I would do camps for the little kids. Couldn't I couldn't speak a lick of of, of Greek, but they understood the common the, the common language of basketball. You know, you know, all I had to do was demonstrate. So I would go to this small school in the community of of Limassol, and I would you know, teach, teach, you know, teach basketball to the young kids. And I've gained a reputation, I gained a reputation um, to the point where, you know, uh, one of the um, uh, board members of, uh, it's called IL, you know, the team was IL. Okay. So, I gained, so um, he had a daughter who played for the women's team IL and his name was Bombos and, um, and uh, he's still alive. And he said, uh, he said, what do you do in America? Oh, wow. Like what hey, hey, hey Jonathan. Yeah. What do you what what do you do in in America? And I said, I do camps. And so he uh, he let his daughter travel from Cyprus to come be a part of my basketball camp. Wow. Really? I, yes. Yeah. Nicolina. Nicolina Kuzi. We still friends today. Her daughter, her sister Maria, used to teach me Greek. So in my spare time, right, I would go instead of you know how you know how when you play overseas. I think you played overseas. You go, you go, you have a lot of time. So on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, I would go to uh, this house, Bambo's house, and his daughter Maria would teach me Greek. And, and 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 Nicolina, who was younger, she was she was a hooper. She ended up coming to to the states, and introduced her to the states. Then she called home, right? She called home, and she said uh, she called to the one of the national team coaches because they wanted to come to my camp, and they sent three boys over. And the three boys, they sent three of the Cyprus young sixteen. Uh, uh, players, they played on my team in Cyprus, right? They were teammates of mine because you know the young kids play on the professional teams. Oh, okay, in Cyprus. In Cyprus, and okay. yeah, they were sixteen, so they played on. They played two of them played on my team, and one of them played uh, 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 for a different team that we played against. So they came to Cyprus, and and one of the kids had aspirations to to live in and live in the states and play high school basketball. 
And so, um, um, and so Alex, I can't think of Alex's last name, but Alex came, he went to my camp for a week, and then we set it up where they went to the University of Michigan camp. Wow. And, and then he ended up uh, connecting with a high school coach, Lamonte Stone. You know Lamonte Stone? The name is familiar. He yes. coached at Bowling Green with Lewis Orr. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So he, they hooked up, and boom, next thing you know, Alex was, uh, Alex was playing uh, on the River Rouge High School team here oh, locally. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting a scholarship, Ohio University. And just last year, wow. just last year, Alex, we talked on the phone and he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, some of my great friends live in Livonia, Michigan. He said, I want to tell you that it's all because of you, because you introduced, you know, the United States to us and our families and my family, they trusted you. And then, you know, they came over, man. So it, it, that that by far, Cyprus always has a, a special part in my heart, um, and probably the least. I, I don't know if there was any least. Maybe Mexico. I like Mexico, but maybe that would be the least. Hmm. And so now, you know, Glenn, you you have been pouring into young people. Sounds like since you were playing professionally, but even now as an athletic director. I know you did parks and recreation with the city of Highland Park. Um, what what did you learn from basketball that you impart on some of these young people that you work with? Uh, the most important thing that I learned is, um, you know, it, it it you know the, what the team dynamic can do for you. You know, um, I try to you know I work at a, a Christian school and I try to bring biblical principles alive in sports. You know, being faithful, you know, being faithful to your teammates. You know, if you're like I heard you say, you know, you 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 were the one in the locker room that was pushing the guys, pushing that button. Say, hey, man, you know, did you stay up all? Did you go to cams? Like, you know what I'm saying? You was that one. And so, it's, it, you know, what do you do? What You know, commitment. You know what I'm saying? So being faithful and committed to your family and uh, that, you know, like, you know, I tell my wife, you know, I'm not perfect. I, I know that you know, at some point I'm going to fail you, you know, but I'm not failing you maliciously, but you, you, you know what I'm saying? It, but the team, the, to answer your question is commitment, dedication, being faithful to a, to, to a, to a cause. And so those are the things that, that, you know, that, uh, that I've learned from sports, basketball, and what I try to instill into our young athletes. And uh, one of the things is is making a person feel important you know i have um you know sometimes team mates or players on a team they value their value to a team based on box scores mm. so and so that's not an accurate assessment of your value to a team right you know and so it is up to a coach right to make sure that they Make sure that every person on that team is important and it's not based on box scores. You know, it's, it's based on, you know, what do you, 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 you provide, you're a leader off the bench. You know, you may not play 20 minutes, you may play five minutes, but you provide leadership on the bench. Your enthusiasm, you have to find something in every, every player. And so what we try to do at our school, and we try to, I try to uh, deem two ways of coaching. You have one, you have, you know, a coach who uh, is, um, you know, compassionate, right? Compassionate about the players. Then you have, you know, no, let me, let me, transformational and transactional, okay? So you ask yourself, what coach are you? Are you a transformational coach or you're a transactional coach? Transactional coach only cares about the individual uh, that, what they bring to the table, like a basketball, football player, whatever. But a transformational coach is one who cares deeply about everything about that player. So whether they add 15 points a game or zero points a game, you still care about that individual. So that's, that's, those are some of the things that I've learned that I've tried to bring alive in, in sports. And I, I can't imagine, Glenn, but I, I have a feeling that things have definitely changed from when we were – coming up in, in basketball and in sports and you at the athletic director's level, 
you've got a lot of responsibility for the kids, for the administration, for your coaches, but I'm sure you have to deal with parents as well. Has that, is, are parents the toughest part of that job now? Yeah, because the parents are, uh, there are a lot of parents that are dis, dis what's that, disillusional? They, they, uh, yeah, delusional. Yeah. Del, yeah. Yep. They, they, uh, it's crazy. I mean, I have, I have, uh, it's crazy, man. It's, it's, I was getting ready to say, I'm glad I held, held, held my tongue on that one. They, they, delusional. They're delusional about their kids. And so what you want to do is you want to have, you want to, the, you know, you want to have reality. So there's, you know, as an athletic director, there are a lot of different tools that we try to provide our parents, okay? And one of the tools uh, that I've tried to provide or just share in general is sit down with your kid at the beginning of a season, right? And you sit down and you, you know, you go over goals, right? You try to go over with your, the, the spouse, husband, if there's a husband and wife in the household, mother, father in the household, both of you all sit down and say, this is where I see Johnny playing. This is what I see how he's going to play. This is what he's going to bring to the team, right? Mm -hmm. Then you ask yourself, what do you, want to, what do you want for your kid to get out of that this year? You know, what goal is it that you want? And then now you're going to ask your child, where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself, right? Do you see yourself as the, the starting guard? Do you see yourself as, you know, whatever? If we can get parents to do that and have a reality, but everybody wants their kid to be the star, you know, everybody, you know what I'm saying? And I've had to, you know, uh, I had to uh, uh, tame myself down because of course, and you too, you have kids, you've they've played sports and you know, you've had, you, you, you want, you know, as an athletic director and my kids go to the school, I've had to, you know, kind of, you know, try my best to tone that down. But mm -hmm. really to get to your question, the, the parents, um, the expectations of the parents um, uh, is they kind of way out there, and I and I kind of blame it on the the social media, the AAU, you know, every like for example, are you making a play to make a post? Are you making a play to be to be efficient on the team? That's a great that's a great point, Glenn. So sometimes that you can't wait to make a play. Look what I did. I broke his ankles. So now somebody taped it. So now you're going to put it on Instagram or you're going to put it on your Snapchat, whatever. Right. And so, so it becomes like, I'm just making a play just to make a post. Right. And so, so, you know, I have with my son, Jonathan, you know, freshman, he's had a pretty good freshman year and he's, he had a game where he had 33 points on a good team. Oh, wow. I, I didn't post it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't post it uh, because it's, I, you know, you know, I like for let somebody else give you the praise. Don't praise yourself. You know, let people, let others give you the praise. It, it, if you're good, eventually they're going to find out. Oh, that's true. You know, and so uh, I, I just recently made, I just recently posted a post on Facebook. I don't know if you saw it or not. Uh, he made all conference. Uh, well, some other kid. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, you know, he averaged 20 points as a freshman. Wow. We're, you know, he's division, it's division four, so probably similar. What's low? What was low? So probably St. Mel was what? That was. I'd say, yep, they were small yeah. school. Yeah, so, so, so Jonathan was, you know, we got class A, B, C, D. So for division four, he averaged 20 points a game as a freshman, and uh, he did a good job. But I don't, you know, I, I don't publicize that because it's a, it creates a false sense of uh, security, in my opinion. You just got to go and work. And I hope I answered your question in regards to parents. You did. As a, yeah, as an athletic director, we, 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 uh, we try to guard against that. And uh, one thing is that I try to do as an athletic director is if, I, if I'm coaching a kid and I, and I'm, and I see that, um, um, that he doesn't like a decision that I make, I'll call the parent and I'll say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm making a decision, and it's, he's going to come home, and he's going to say that he's going to complain. I guarantee he's going to complain. So let me and you partner, mm -hmm. right? Let me and you partner on this. This is how the, uh, how how I would like the outcome. If I'm wrong about this decision, I will call you. I will make sure that you know that I'm wrong about it. And you know, and I've had that happen. I had a kid. Um, he was a freshman.
He wanted to play as a freshman. He wanted to play on varsity with uh, his sister's boyfriend, you know, and he, and he was six, six and he wanted to play, but he wasn't ready. He wasn't quite ready. Okay. So, so I told him, I said, listen, I said, there's a chance. I said, I can't tell you that you're not going to play varsity at all this year. Um, but I want to start you off on JV. And he understood that he accepted it. Six, seven games go down. He's still on JV, right? So we had a big game come up and I didn't move him up for the big game. Okay. But before that, I talked to the parent. I said, he's going to come home and complain. And so the parent admittedly said, this is a struggle for us because we believe he should be on varsity, but we're going to submit to your authority. We're going to, and sure enough, it worked out. You know what I'm saying? And when I missed it, when I missed it, I admit that I missed it. There was one game I didn't move him up and he had 20 points and 20 rebounds. And he texted me and said, 2020. And he didn't say nothing. That was it. And so I ended up moving him up and uh, he made all conference at you know, the latter part of the season. And, um, but again, if you can have that open communication with a parent, um, then I think that would be good. Where, what's the school that your athletic director at, Glenn? I'm at uh, Novi Christian Academy. It's in Novi. Okay. And you've been there now, what 13 about? Years. 13 I mean, years. 13 years. Wow. That's a heck of a run. Yeah. 13 years. Yep. So 13 years. Is this the position that you eventually want to, you, this is, you. I, I know you're happy in it. You, you're fulfilled. Is there other aspirations or anything else that you're looking to do uh, professionally? Well, um, you know, to be honest with you, this is uh, this is my last year there at uh, Nova Christian okay. Academy. So, 13 years, it's a lot of work, and 13 years as an AD from K K12. We're a K12 school, mm -hmm. and um, we're part of uh, the, a ministry. It's a church called Brightmore Christian Church, and so um, I. I I I sensed I've been sensing maybe over the last two years that you know I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to do it because it's a lot of work, you know you spend a lot of time away from your family, mm -hmm. and the average AD at least lasts seven years. So I so I doubled that. Yeah, really, I'm, I'm I'm telling you, and you know for our school we are a small Christian school, we don't have some of the resources that the public school has, like a second gym, we don't have a second. So it becomes very challenging. And, um, but the school in itself is a great school. It's been a great school. The people have backed uh, my family and I. And uh, this year was a tough year. I think I shared with you about, you know, my oldest son and yep. you know, academics, you know, he had, he went through some, you know, some things academically. It was, it was really, you know, it was tough on us, but, you know, the Lord said, hey, this is a good step. This is a good learning lesson for him. And um, just, just, just support him, do your best. But, it, it, you know, it's, it's time. And, um, you know, me and the superintendent, we sat down about, uh, about a month, about three weeks ago. And we said, look, you know, it's, it's time. But uh, it's, it's, so to answer your question, what's next for Glenn Blackwell? I think that, um, you know, I would like to, look into um, just probably just focus on basketball. You okay. Know? You know, um, if, I, if I had to uh, write my own script right now, maybe a local college, you know, this local um, that you can be director of player personnel, to, you know, to still, you know, you know, I like coordinating. My, I believe my gifting is coordinating programs, okay? So, um, Whereas an athletic director, you coordinate every program, you know, that's true. That's true. elementary, middle school and high school. And also it's a lot. And you have to, you know, pour into your coaches, the coaches. That's my, that's my team. You know what I'm saying? The coaches, they coach the players, but I coach the coaches. So um, that was a lot. And it was, it was, you know, it wears on you, you know? And so when you, you feel like you're not being productive in that, that wide scope, that wide range, then maybe you need to, you know, uh, look at, you know, taking a step back and reevaluating. But again, if I had to write my own script, Steve, um, <clears throat> looking at something like a director of player personnel um, for, for a basketball team, I think that that would kind of, you know, fit my need, just being able to coordinate things. And then maybe even just getting out there. I don't know about really coaching. Mm -hmm. I like myself as more of a spot coach you know, and, and spot coach, meaning um, uh, just going in the gym, 
player just working on some skills, how to come off a curl and a flare, or how, you know, working on your ball handle, working on the jump shot, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, so I, 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 I'm more of, I've, although I've coached and I like X's and O's and all that, uh, I like player personnel. I like the hands-on. I like counseling. I like speaking into people's lives, encouraging them to be the best that they could be. And um, that that's, I think that's my gifting. Okay. So we're going to see you at a local uh, small, uh, college or something, maybe around the Detroit area, uh, hopefully, something like that. Yeah, in Jesus' name. All right. <laughs> that, yeah. Pro be prophetic for me. <laughs> there you go. In Jesus' name, yeah, Blackwell yeah. will be on someone's staff. Uh, I, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Glenn, where can people find you on, on social media? Where, what's your handle? Uh, my uh, G Glenn Blackwell. You know, Glenn Blackwell. Uh, you can also go to glennblackwell.com. Um, my wife, she, my wife is she, she, she's on me. She, she is this, you know, marketing. She's, she's my brand person, and that's a beautiful thing that she brands me, and uh, she's working on my website. It's glennblackwell.com. You can go on there or um, Glenn Black, we can find me on uh, Instagram, Glenn Blackwell. Also Facebook, you know, Glenn Blackwell. Okay, all right. Well, man, I, Glenn, I can't thank you enough, man, for taking the time and, and, and sharing with me uh, today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I definitely want to tap into you uh, when, when you do get that next gig. Is that yes, cool? sir. Yeah, and I want to show you something. I I, I gotta gotta show you something. Okay. Uh oh. Oh, Black. Black got the old jersey back. Oh, man. How'd you get that? I've been at it. Look at that. And see, here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Glenn can still fit in his old jersey. <laughs> hey, man, I had to, I had to suck, in my, suck in my wind to get it in. That's all but, right. It, it looks good, though, Black. Keep rocking that jersey. Yeah. I, hey, and I also want to, you know, I also want to say this to you that uh, from the time that I met you, um, your freshman year, you came in, you know, you, you were focused, you know, and it doesn't surprise me uh, what you're doing. You came in, uh, uh, again, focused. I remember, Steve, uh, you bench pressed 273 pounds, man. I still remember that. You made me feel like a, I'm a junior. I was a junior, man. You made me feel. I said, "This guy coming in bench pressing 265, 273." But what it taught me was it was it, you were focused, mm. and a lot of the success that that fight in the line nine, that that fight in the line, the, the flying the line, I should say, had is because of you and your focus. And so you know, you continue to do that. Continue to do what you're doing. I'm so proud of you. I don't want to start crying, but I'm so proud of you that you know you're doing what you're doing. And, uh, and you, know, we, you know, we always, we, we're praying for you. We wish the best to you. And I appreciate you uh, allowing me to be on this podcast. Oh, love you, Black. You know I love you, brother. Appreciate you saying that and sharing that. Uh, that'll do it for this edition of Bardo's Breakdown. Make sure you come back to the page. We're going to uh, release interviews like this, or I'll be live, because we're going to get through this corona situation together. Uh, reach out to the loved ones, uh, reach out to people that may be by themselves or shut in or older elderly people, please reach out and uh, connect with the people that you love. Yes. All right. That'll do it. Thank you, Glenn Blackwell. And that'll do it for this edition. Until next time, peace. My man, appreciate you, Black. Yep.